Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. I uh, uh, hope everyone is, is doing well this evening. My name is Francis Beckwith. I am the visiting scholar of conservative thought and policy uh, here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And it's my honor this evening to uh, introduce to you our, our, our speaker, Patrick Deneen, and uh, to say a few things about him. But before I begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the presence of one of the members of the Board of Regents of the University of Colorado, Steve Bosley, who is, who is here with us this evening. Uh, this uh, lecture is sponsored by the Center for Western Civilization Thought and Policy, an academic unit at the University of Colorado, in which I have the honor to hold my appointment for this year. The mission of the center is to promote a critical, re critical reflection of the, on the distinctive traditions and political perspectives that characterize Western civilization, as well as fostering research, debate, and dialogue about the fundamental issues of our time. Its director is philosophy professor Robert Passnow, who I'm happy to say is with us this evening. Our speaker this evening is Patrick Deneen. He is David A. Potenziani, Memorial Associate. Did I get to pronounce that correctly? Potenziani. He is David A. Potenziani, Memorial Associate Professor of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Before uh, coming to Notre Dame, he was at Georgetown University and prior to that, Princeton University. At Georgetown, he was the founder. Uh, founding director of the Tocqueville Forum on the Roots of American Democracy, which became a vibrant center for reflection on the contributions of political thought in American politics and culture. He earned his BA in English Literature and PhD in Political Science from Rutgers University. His intellectual interests are wide-ranging. He's written books on the Odyssey of Homer and its reception and meaning in the history of political thought and on the ways that belief in democracy is consonant with forms of religious belief. He has published articles, essays, and books and book reviews on topics ranging from ancient to modern political thought, democratic the uh, theory and practice, American political thought, uh, political theology, Catholicism and American liberalism, literature and politics, including essays on Mark Twain, Henry Adams, and Wendell Berry. He teaches across his, his areas of interest and offers regular courses with such titles as political theory, constitutionalism, law and politics, liberalism and conservatism, the end of education, the American regime, and Tocqueville's democracy in America. The title of Professor Deneen's talk this evening is The End of Liberalism, Why the World is Falling Apart. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Patrick Deneen. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, to Professor Francis Beckwith for the invitation. Uh, I'm Honored to be invited. I was actually invited last year. Uh, I think it was last year by uh, Brad Bradley Berzer, who I think held it the year before. Was it two years ago? You know, they all blend together, and our schedules didn't work out. And I I lost some hope that I would ever have the opportunity to make it out to Boulder. So I'm I'm deeply grateful uh, for a second chance by the uh, eminent holder of the conservative chair here at the University of Colorado. Uh, I I should I guess in the first instance. Um, Apologize. Uh, this this uh, talk tonight was written while I was at home in South Bend, Indiana. So it reflects all of the deep, depressing aspects of life in Michiana. Uh, six months of the year, we live under something called a perma cloud, uh, a cloud that just never breaks, uh, in which we are uh, we have to pop vitamin D pills every hour, or we will die. Uh, and even just having been in Boulder for half a day, I'm ready to throw this out. Uh, uh, <laughs> My paper, my paper is rather dark and pe pessimistic, and even living here for, uh, being here for a few hours has persuaded me perhaps everything isn't going quite to hell yet, at least not here. Uh, but I'll, I'll persist nevertheless. My second disclaimer is that while I have been invited and very gratefully accepted uh, uh, to, to uh, visit under the auspice of the current holder of the conservative thought chair uh, of the Center for Western Civilization Thought and Policy, I came today not necessarily to praise Western civilization, uh, but maybe in some respects to offer something of its obituary. Uh, 
Uh, in this sense, I am not appearing tonight as a conservative, I suppose, since I have come to the conclusion there's probably very little left to conserve in America or even more broadly Western civilization. Indeed, for a number of years, I've written at least as much in criticism of my, many of my friends uh, who are conservatives and conservatism since what we call conservatism generally in America is a variant of liberalism, what I'll be talking about tonight. And so that the great debates that have roiled our country for roughly the past half century, pitting conservatives against liberals, Republicans against Democrats, have generally been debates within the tradition of liberalism, within variants of the same political philosophy. And one that I'm going to submit tonight has actually conserved very little and which is further premised on deeply flawed and an ultimately unsustainable vision of the human person and human society. And I will submit, in spite of being in Boulder, that all around us we are seeing the rotten fruits of the realization of this fatal, flawed political philosophy. My thesis, deep in the Depression, is that liberalism is failing not because it is falling short, but because it is becoming ever more true to itself. Liberalism is failing because liberalism is succeeding. As liberalism has become more fully itself, as its inner logic has become more evident and its self-contradictions manifest, it has generated pathologies that are at once deformations, but also realizations of its ideology. A political philosophy that was launched to foster greater equity, defend a rich pluralist tapestry of different cultures and beliefs, to protect human dignity, and of course, above all, to expand liberty, in practice has generated titanic inequality and forces uniformity and homogeneity fosters material and spiritual degradation and has undermined freedom. Liberalism's success can be measured by the achievement of the opposite of what we have come to believe it would achieve. But rather than seeing the accumulating evidence as failure to live up to liberalism's ideals, I would argue that we need to rather see clearly that the ruins it has produced are signs of its very success. Those ruins surround us like the decays of antiquity that are everywhere to be found in today's Rome. Opinions about America, those who have been paying attention recently, have taken a decisively negative turn here in the early part of the 21st century. Some 70% of our countrymen believe that the country is headed in the wrong direction, and half or more than half the country thinks that its best days are behind it. Most believe that their children will be less prosperous and have fewer opportunities than a previous generation. Our election season, yes, I hesitate to mention it, has been one of unexpected drama tinged with more than an edge of madness, the usual well-scripted performances tossed aside as a popular uprising against our governing class and economic system threatens to upend business as usual. Evident to all is that the political system is broken and our social fabric is fraying particularly as the growing gap between wealthy haves and left behind have-nots increases, as a hostile divide widens between faithful and secular, and deep disagreement persists over America's role in the world. Wealthy Americans continue to build gated enclaves in and around select cities where they congregate, this might be one, while growing numbers of Christians compare our times to that like the late Roman Empire, and ponder a fundamental withdrawal from wider American society into updated forms of Benedictine monastic communities. Signs of the times suggest that much is wrong with America. A growing chorus of voices even suggests that we may be witnessing the end of the Republic unfolding before our eyes with some, with some yet unnamed regime in the midst of taking its place. If indeed something more fundamental and transformative than normal politics is happening, Quite possible we are witnessing not just a political realignment or the dying gasp of an old white working class or the lashing out of a debt burdened youth, but rather an increasingly systemic failure of a political system that we have come largely to take for granted. More than just a breakdown in electoral politics or a moment for institutional tinkering, 
the possibility increasingly presents itself that we are witnessing at least the beginnings of the death throes of the political philosophy of liberalism, the fabric of beliefs that arose some 500 years ago and gave rise to this 226-year-old American constitutional experiment. Now, while a number of our founding fathers believed that they had lighted on a new science of politics, and in particular one that they thought would resist the inevitable tendency of all regimes to decay and eventually to die. Even, in the words of one, comparing the constitutional order to an entropy-defying perpetual motion device, describing it as a machine that would go of itself. We might rightly wonder, though, whether America is not in the early days of its eternal life, but rather approaching the end of the natural life cycle of corruption and decay that seems to limit the lifespan of all humans and all human creations. This political philosophy of ours, liberalism, has been for modern Americans like fish, I'm sorry, like water for a fish, a largely undiscerned encompassing political ecosystem, ecosystem in which we have swum, largely unaware of its existence. It is the first of the world's great modern ideologies and of the three great and in some cases, obviously, quite pernicious modern ideologies that also included fascism and communism, is the only one that is still standing. Liberalism as a philosophy and practice is the world's first ideology, that first architecture that proposed transforming all of human life to conform to a preconceived notion of human nature and a political plan. We live in a thoroughgoingly liberal society, the first nation founded by the explicit embrace of liberal philosophy and whose citizenry is shaped almost entirely by its commitments and vision. Yet unlike the horrific regimes that arose in, dedicating, in, in, in dedicated to and advancing the ideologies of fascism and communism, liberalism is less visibly ideological and only surreptitiously authoritarian and thus also far more insidious. As an ideology, it pretends to neutrality of having no preference or shaping force over the souls of humanity under its rule. It ingratiates by invitation to the pleasures and attractions of freedom, pleasure, and wealth. It makes itself invisible, much like an operating system on a computer that goes largely unseen, well, at least until it malfunctions or crashes. Liberalism, in a sense, becomes daily more visible to us precisely because its deformations are becoming too obvious or visible to ignore. As Socrates tells us in the Republic of Plato, most humans in most times live in a cave, but believe it to be the complete reality or the whole of reality. What's perhaps most insidious about the cave that we occupy is that its walls are like the backdrop of old movie sets. Think of The Wizard of Oz, promising seemingly endless vistas without constraint or limits, and thus whose walls or methods of containment are invisible to us, indiscernible as a cavern that constrains our capacity to see and discern and to discern the nature of our confinement. When I teach the Republic of Plato, none of my students think that we live in a cave. That, to me, is already a sign that they are so deeply in the cave they can't even see that they're in a cave. But among the few iron laws of politics, few seem more unbreakable than the ultimate unsustainability of ideology. Ideology fails and has failed, at least historically, for two reasons. First, ideology is based on a falsehood about human nature, and hence can't help but ultimately fail. And second, as those falsehoods become more evident, the gap grows between what the ideology insists we believe to be the case about it and the lived experience of human beings under that ideology, till the point arrives that the regime can no longer persuade people of what it claims it is, in which it can no longer be believed and becomes unsupported by its people and illegitimate in their eyes. Thus, even as liberalism has succeeded, penetrating nearly every nation on earth aside from a few holdouts, its vision of human liberty seems increasingly to be a taunt rather than a promise. Far from celebrating the utopic freedom at the end of history that was seemingly our inheritance when the last competitor ideology fell in 1989, and that was the year that Francis Fukuyama published 
his now famous essay, The End of History. Liberal humanity today is burdened by the mounting failures of its successes, and in particular per pervasively perceives itself to be caught in a trap of its own making, entangled in the very apparatus that was supposed to grant pure and unmitigated freedom. We can see this especially today in four distinct but connected areas of our common life that I will touch on briefly for the next few minutes. Politics, or the false promises of representative democracy. Economics, or how free markets have made the globe its prison. Education, or why liberalism has killed the liberal arts. Science and technology, or how the tools of our freedom have made us its tools. In each of these domains, liberalism has transformed human institutions in the name of expanding liberty and of increased mastery and control of our fates. And in each case, we witness today pervasive anger and deepening discontent arising from the felt and I think very real sense that the vehicles of our liberation have become the iron cages of our captivity. Citizens of advanced liberal democracies are today in near revolt against their own governments, the establishment and the politicians that they have themselves selected in most cases as their leaders and representatives. In overwhelming supermajorities, they regard their governments as distant and unresponsive, holding them in very low regard, in spite of the fact that they have chosen these leaders, regarding them as entirely captured by wealthy and ruling solely on the basis of the advantage of the powerful. At its inception, liberalism promised to displace the old aristocracy in the name of equity and of liberty. And yet, as it eliminates every last vestige of the old order, the heirs of their hopeful anti-aristocratic forebears regard its replacement as anything other than a new and perhaps even more pernicious kind of aristocracy, a kind of liberalocracy, if I can coin a new term, Liberalism was premised upon the limitation of government and the liberation of the individual from arbitrary political control. But growing numbers of citizens regard their government as an entity separate and indeed out of their own will and control, not their creature and their creation, as was premised and promised in liberal philosophy. The purported liber limited government of liberalism today would provoke jealousy and amazement from the tyrants of old who could only dream of such extensive capacities for surveillance and control of movement, of finances, of deeds, and even thoughts. The various liberties that liberalism was brought into being to protect individual rights of conscience, religion, association, speech, self-governance, are extensively compromised by the ongoing expansion both of government activity and of self-patrolling political correctness into every realm of human life. Yet this expansion continues in significant part as a response to people's felt loss of power over the trajectory of their lives in so many distinct spheres, including economic, as I'll get to, leading to demands for further activity and intervention by the one entity that seems even nominally under their control to redress their weakness. Now I'm just channeling Tocqueville straight here. This is right out of Tocqueville, right? People who feel weak and powerless will turn to the government because it's the one thing that they think they can control. Our government, of course, readily complies, moving in a ratchet wrench, like a ratchet wrench, always in one direction, always enlarging, always expanding, in, main, in the main in response to civic demands for redress of injustice and grievances and weakness, but ironically leading in turn to the further experience of alienation and distance and powerlessness among its citizenry. Citizens thus feel disconnected and powerless, each only tenuously connected to the political representatives whose work it was in the beginning, and according to the Federalist Papers, to refine and enlarge the public sentiment. Speak to representatives. When I worked at Georgetown, I would often meet representatives, our elected leaders. Speak to them. Do they feel powerful? Do they feel in control of the government? It's striking. They will admit to you fully that they feel powerless in relationship to a permanent bureaucracy staffed by career employees who are incentivized to maintain or enlarge their budgets and activity. To affect political ends, more, uh, more power accrues to the executive branch, 
which of course nominally at least controls the bureaucracy and through administrative rules can at least provide the appearance of responsiveness to arrestive polity. More power accrues to the head of state with tenuously popular lawmaking by the legislature replaced increasingly either by laws that are essentially grants of power to the bureaucracy, think Obamacare, or literally simply mandates of the executive uh, who, whose office is achieved and accomplished through massive influxes of donations and lucre. Liberalism, remember, one of its core claims was to replace arbitrary rule by a distant, powerful, and popularly unchosen leader with responsive rule through popularly mandated elected public servants. Yet our electoral process today, as I think so many of our citizens feel, appears to be more of something like a Potemkin drama meant to convey the appearance of popular consent for a figure who will exercise incomparable arbitrary powers over domestic policy, international arrangements, and especially war-making powers. Would it be possible to get a little water? The distance and are you getting some? Frank, I think you may. The distance and lack of control keenly felt by the citizenry of modern liberalism is not a condition to be solved by better and more perfect liberalism. Got 17 people out looking for, I'll have gallons. Thank you. It's not a condition to be solved by a better and more perfect liberalism. Rather, it is itself the culmination of the liberal order. It's crisis of governance, a sign of its very success. Liberalism believed it could achieve a kind of modus vivendi by encouraging privatism among the citizenry. Right? Responsible rule by, the, uh, by, by its elected leaders. It would encourage focus on private concerns, particularly among the citizenry on the economy. They would create what, uh, what I've called a res idiotica, as opposed to a res publica. Res idiotica, the word idiotes in the Greek means private person. Idiot means private person. They created, in fact, a res idiotica that they called a republic. It believed that it could achieve a kind of modus vivendi by encouraging privatism, but culminated in near complete disassociation of a governing class, citizenry, without a, C, about, without a key ways, without a C. Our civic unhappiness is mirrored in our economic discontent. Citizens today are more likely to be called consumers if you read the newspapers or listen to the news. Yet the liberty to buy every imaginable consumer good does little to assuage the widespread sense of economic anxiety and discontent, particularly over waxing inequality. Indeed, the assumption by economic leaders seems to be that increased purchasing power of inexpensive goods will comp compensate for the absence of economic security and the division of the world into generational economic winners and losers. In the minds of most human, modern humans, all spheres of our life exist to ensure success in the economy. Politics and politicians are judged on whether or not they can increase our GDP. Schools justify their existence to ensure the economic success of their consumers, people we once called students. And even families increasingly are judged, for example, by sociologists, on whether they are, fit, are failing or succeeding, depending on whether they produced well-adjusted workers, what we used to call children. The economic historian Karl Polanyi describes in his, I think, too often unread book, The Great Transformation, how it came to be that what was once regarded as a tool or a means for human flourishing, the economy, which means literally the management of the household, oikos nomos, the law of the household, came to be understood as an end in itself. As Polanyi describes in his great book, before the advent of the modern era, economic exchange was understood to exist to support the moral norms of a community, religious, social, and familial. The replacement of this form of economy or understanding of economy with what we know of today, driven above all by considerations of utility maximizing individuals to the end of maximizing especially their wealth, was not simply the result of liberating people from their backward societies, but the result of concentrated 
forceful and often violent reshaping of an existing life world, most often by economic and political elites disrupting and displacing traditional community practices. So of course, in our own history, is most visibly the case with Native Americans. But it was part of a long-standing project that had begun before the end of the Middle Ages. It also required not only the separation of markets from social and religious contexts, in some cases requiring the actual physical destruction of markets and its replacement by an abstract market, but for people to reimagine themselves and the world as, in the way in which Polanyi describes as fictitious commodities, as materials for use in industrial processes in order to dis disassociate markets from historical, religious, social, and moral contexts and to retrain people to think of themselves, to imagine themselves primarily as individual actors whose economic activities were conceptually disconnected from the economic activities of anyone else. Think of Adam Smith's description of why we engage in trade, except we don't do so out of concern for anyone else or our own. As Polanyi pithily described this transformation, I quote, laissez-faire was planned. One of the fruits of this new economic system was the replacement of social hierarchy and relatively similar economic conditions. Right? Social hierarchy, but relatively similar economic conditions. So even the status of the king, if you ever visited castles in medieval Europe, you have to notice they were probably really drafty, uh, places. Okay. Toiletry, you know, plumbing wasn't good. The, the economic distance between the poorest and the wealthy was not as vast, certainly as ours. So we replaced social hierarchy, but relatively similar economic conditions with equality of opportunity and titanic economic inequality. Now, there has always been and likely always will be economic inequality, but few civilizations appear to have so extensively perfected the complete separation of economic winners from economic losers, and a massive apparatus to winnow those who will succeed from those who will not. Marx once argued that the greatest source of economic discontent was not necessarily inequality itself, but alienation, the division of worker from product, the division of the human from the thing that they did, and the attendant loss of any connection with or connection to the goal or object of one's efforts. Today's economy not only maintains and in many ways extends this form of alienation, many people can hardly describe what it is they do in their cubicles, but it adds to it a profound new form of geographic alienation, the physical separation of beneficiaries of the globalized economy from those it has left behind, leading economic winners both to simultaneous lamentations of economic inequality, so do voce denunciations of the backward views of those who condemn globalization force. While, it's, while the losers it produces are consoled with a reminder that they are wealthy beyond compare even to the wealthiest arist aristocrats of an earlier age. Material comforts are to be ready solve for the discontents of the soul. As the reactions in the urban centers to the outcome of the Brexit vote and to the nomination of Donald Trump events, those same leaders are shocked, shocked that the terms of the agreement appear not to be acceptable to Walmart shoppers or whatever that is in London. Still nothing can finally be done. Nothing can be done because globalization is not only the culmination of liberalization itself, it is an inevitable process, unstoppable by any particular person, political leader, or nation. Whatever one thinks of economic integration, standardization and homogenization of markets, it is pointless to entertain thoughts of alternatives. One of globalization's cheerleaders, Thomas Friedman, has defined globalization in just these terms of inevitability, and I'll quote him. It is the inevitable integration of markets, nation states, and technologies to a degree never witnessed before in a way that is enabling individuals, corporations, and nation states to reach around the world farther, faster, deeper, and cheaper than ever before and in a way that is enabling the world to reach into individuals, to reach into individuals, corporations, and nation states farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than before. Now whether individuals or corporations or nations want the world reaching into them is not a matter for discussion or debate because the process is inevitable. 
I could also give you a lot of quotes by Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, saying exactly the same. She doesn't say it right now, these days, but she sure did earlier. The economic system is sim simultaneously both liberalism's handmaid and its engine. Like a Frankenstein monster takes on a life of its own, and its processes and logic can no longer be stopped or controlled by people purportedly enjoying the greatest freedom in the history of humanity. The wages of freedom are bondage to economic inevitability. The way in which we educate, moving on, is transformed in keeping with political and economic demands. The rising generation must embrace a political and economic system that, in the words of many, certainly in my experience, they widely abhor, filling them with cynicism toward their future and their participation in maintaining an order that they cannot avoid but in which they do not believe and do not trust. Far from feeling themselves to be the most liberated and autonomous generation in history, young adults, certainly in my experience teaching at the institutions I've taught, really good schools, top 20 schools, feel themselves to be, feel, believe that it is, that believe less in their task at hand than Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the mountainside. They exceed, they do exceedingly well in the duties demanded of them, by their elders to succeed in these systems without joy and without love, only with a keen sense of having no other choice. Their overwhelming response to their, to their lot expressed to me in countless responses over the years in which I've asked them to describe their experience and their expectations of their own education is the sense of entrapment, of no exit, of being cynical participa par participants in a system that produces winners and losers in which they can only harbor keen hopes that they will be among its winners, but which at the same time demands, demands that they declare that the system be a vehicle of social justice. One can hardly be surprised that even the winners admit during a frank moment that they have been swindlers and swindled. They are swindlers and have been swindled. As one student poignantly described this to me just in a paper I assigned at the beginning of the semester, and of course I'm teaching right now on education, a lot of his generation and the description of his ceaseless striving in school that got him into Notre Dame and beyond. And I'll quote, we are meritocrats out of survivalist instinct. We do not raise to the very top. If we do not raise to the very top, the only remaining option is a bottomless pit of failure. To simply work hard and get decent grades doesn't cut it anymore if you believe there are only two options, the very top or rock bottom. It is a classic prisoner's dilemma. To sit around for two to three hours at the dining hall shooting the breeze, or to spend time engaged in intellectual conversation in moral and philosophical issues, or to go on a date, all detract from time we could be spending on getting to the top, and thus will leave us worse off than everyone else. Because we view humanity and thus its institutions as corrupt and selfish, the only person we can rely upon is our own self. The only way we can avoid failure of being let down and ultimately succumbing to the chaotic world around us, therefore, is to have the means, and he says financial security, to rely upon ourselves. And I quote, very articulate student, good student. Advanced liberalism, remarkably, is eliminating liberal education with keen intent and ferocity, finding it to be impractical, both ideologically and economically. Students today are taught by most of their humanities and social science professors that the only remaining matter at hand is no longer to grapple with the great ideas and the great debates, but to equalize respect and dignity necessary and accorded to all people, even as they work in institutions that are factories for sifting the economic viable, economically viable from those who will be mocked from their for their backward views on trade, immigration, nationhood, and religious beliefs. The near unanimity of political views, I hear you had a talk on this recently, the near unanimity of political views represented on college campuses is echoed by the pervasive belief that an education must be economically practical, eliciting in high paying jobs in a city populated by like-minded graduates who will continue to reinforce their keen sense of outrage over inequality while enjoying the bounteous fruits of their credentials, connections, and upward mobility. 
Universities scramble either to provide practical learning outcomes, either by introducing a raft of new programs aimed to make students immediately employable, or by redescribing, rebranding, and reorienting existing studies in order to tout their economic relevance. There is simply no choice to do otherwise in a globalizing, economically competitive world. You have any remark upon the fact that this locution, there is no choice, is ever more common in advanced liberalism. That system, that regime that was supposed to ensure endless free choice. At the moment of liberalism's culmination, then we see around us the headlong evacuation of the liberal arts. Think about this. What are the liberal arts? Why are they called this? The liberal arts were understood to be the form of education. That's why it's called liberal. It's not because people are on the left or the right. Education of a free person, especially for citizens who aspire to self-government. The emphasis on the great texts and the traditions, Western civilization, was not simply because they were old, but because they contained hard-won lessons on how humans learn to be free, especially free from the tyranny of their own desires. But this education is increasingly jettisoned in favor of what was once called in an earlier time servile education, an education concerned exclusively with money-making and with a life of work, and hence an education that was reserved for those who did not enjoy the title of citizen. Today's liberals condemn a system that once separated freemen from serf, master from slave, citizen from servant. Yet even as we have ascended to the summit of moral superiority over our benighted forebears by proclaiming that everyone is free, we have almost exclusively adopted the educational form that was once reserved for those who were deprived of the privilege of freedom. But in the midst of our freedom, we don't think to ask why it is that we no longer have the luxury of an education whose very name, the liberal arts, indicates the fundamental support of the cultivation of a free person. Today's students are especially encouraged to study a discipline that is useful, particularly related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Liberalism's tools of liberation of humanity from various forms of bondage were especially to be achieved through the transformation in politics, the representative system I've mentioned. Economic system, particularly market capitalism, whose globalizing logic cannot be resisted. And of course, science and technology, arguably among the greatest sources of our liberation, especially from nature. And yet simultaneously the reason for so many of our contemporary crises our imperiled environment, the deformations wrought by our own technologies on our very personhood, and the deep and pervasive anxiety that arises from a suspicion that we may not be able to control our own innovations. The modern scientific project that envisioned human liberation from the tyranny of nature framed this project originally at its inception as the effort to master or to control nature and was more often than not described as a war against nature in which the study of nature would provide the tools for her own subjugation at the hands of a victorious humanity. The originator, or among the reg originators of this project, Professor Beckless forebear, Francis Bacon, who rejected classical arguments that learning ought to aim at virtue, especially wisdom, prudence, and justice, but instead argued that knowledge is power. In striking passages in his writings, describe nature as comparable to a prisoner who withheld her secrets from an interrogator, but that under torture might be compelled to reveal her long hidden secrets. Now, even if we don't speak in these terms anymore, and we did until fairly recent times, the modern scientific project now dominates our thinking about and what we regard as useful and rewarding inquiry. Yet nature seems not to have quite waved the white flag yet. As the farmer and author Wendell Berry, a writer I've, was mentioned I've written on and admire, if modern science and technology was conceived as a war against nature, then as he wrote in the first instance, it is a war in every sense. Nature is fighting us as much as we are fighting it. And secondly, it appears we are losing. So much of what we call today our environmental crisis, climate change, resource depletion, groundwater contamination, aquifer 
shortages, species extinction, and so on, are signs of battles won and of war being lost. Today we are accustomed to arguing that we should follow the science. That's the term of art. Listen to our political candidates. Follow the science in issues such as climate change, ignoring that our crisis is the result of what had been considered following the science in its day. And indeed, the, 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 the fruits of a long-standing triumph of science and technolo technology. Our carbon-saturated world is today the hangover of a 150-year-old party in which, until the very end, we believed had allowed us to liberate ourselves from nature's limits and achieve the dream of human liberation from the constraints of nature. I would submit that we still believe this, generally holding the incoherent view that science can liberate us from limits while simultaneously solving the attendant consequences of our own limitation. Meanwhile, our technology, to talk a little bit closer to home to many of us, these devices that we all carry, when we use the word technology, we usually mean cell phones these days, our, the technology that promises liberations from time and place and, is, and even given identity, even freeing us from our given identity, itself increasingly shapes us, at least if arguments that have been advanced by the likes of Nicholas Carr and Sherry Turkle are to be credited. Carr has argued in a book I think everyone should read called The Shallows, that our technology is shaping the very structure of our minds, the neural pathways that once shaped our thinking, turning us into different creatures, conforming us to the demands and the nature of the technology that is supposed to allow us to express ourselves. How many of us can sit for an hour reading a book and simply, or simply thinking or meditating without that longing of an addict, of an addict just for one hit of that cell phone, <laughs> that craving that won't allow us to think or concentrate or reflect until we've had that and Sherry Turkle has argued in a book she's written called Alone Together, using experiments and studies in social psychology, that the technology that is supposed to connect us more extensively and intimately wherever we are is making us more isolated, more lonely, more apart. That which is supposed to allow us to transform our world is instead transforming us, making us into creatures that many, if not most of us, have not given our consent to, or at least not informed consent. They, indeed, it is making us ever more into the creatures that liberalism presupposed was our nature, in that state of nature, before the existence of law, of civilization, of government. Ironically, but perhaps not uncoincidentally, the political project of liberalism is shaping us into the creatures that it posited was our nature in some prehistorical fantasy, autonomous free, individual, but which in fact has required the combined massive apparatus of the modern state, the modern economy, the modern education system, and our science and technology to turn us into increasingly separate, autonomous, non-relational selves defined by our rights and defined by our liberty, but insecure, powerless, afraid, alone. So I'll conclude in that happy note. <laughs> Liberalism's success today, as I suggested at the beginning, is a sign, in some ways, of its failure. It has remade the world in its image, especially through the realms of politics, economics, education, and technology, all aimed at achieving the condition of supreme and complete freedom through the liberation of the individual from particular places, relationships, memberships, and even identity. In our liberation, then, we are rendered increasingly incapable of resisting the forces of our, that have ensured our freedom, the tools that were supposed to free us, now in many ways are the tools that shape us, that make us powerless. Now, I had another 15 pages to tell you my answer to what is to be done. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about that tonight, so I'll just have to have another invitation, Frank. I will end there on that happy note, but at least with the hope that until we can, or at least the suggestion that until we can correctly diagnose our condition, we will continue to treat all of these various symptoms of a, a system in crisis as separate and as solvable by that system, rather than as manifestations of a system that itself has generated these titanic pathologies 
that I think we're beginning to have to call by name. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Uh, it's, we've got about maybe 20, 25 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, let, let's, um, let's begin with any students who may have any questions. Uh, you could be a graduate student. I saw <laughs> that, so. Oh, you, you should because you need it recorded. Okay, we have to be recorded. Oh, okay, okay. So, what did uh, I tell you? Thank, thank you for the talk. tell us? I, uh, I wonder how many of these uh, pathologies of liberalism are just products of false hopes or unrealistic hopes. So uh, with your student, it reminded me of uh, the book Generation Me, with which I'm sure you're familiar, uh, about uh, millennials and the sort of things they hope for. So one of, the, one of the statistics given in the book is how many uh, millennials expect to be artists or, or something like that, you know, 20%. People think they're going to be Price artists. Or, right. Um, so, yeah, everybody thinks they're going to get a, a like, they're going to be fully autonomous and in, in, in some unrealistic sense, and Twitter's going to bring democracy to the Middle East, and, and uh, you know, all of this un unrealistic stuff. But if you take a more realistic metric, I mean, how much freedom, I mean, how hopeless would, would your student feel if your student were brought up with the expectations of 1900? Uh, I mean, look at uh, uh, Deidre McCloskey's books on, on how we're 100 times wealthier than our ancestors in 1800. Um, if you have a more reasonable metric, um, things don't look so dire. Uh, just first to your, to your more reasonable metric, well, I always find this to be the most unreasonable metric. Because the metric is to lead us to believe that 100 years ago, in the year 1900, is that the year you mentioned? Everyone was sitting around so freaking miserable because they weren't as wealthy as the people living in 2016. But that's a measure. How miserable are you? How miserable are your pathetic lives compared to the Jetsons? Right? Is that how you spend most of your time thinking? I am so mis I can't enjoy anything in my life right now. Because I know in 100 years, people are going to be so much wealthier and better off. They're going to live so much longer. So I may as well just kill myself right now. I find that metric to be a little bit ridiculous. It's a little bit presentist in some senses. But, okay. Uh, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I, it may be the quote from that student and my experience with my students may be in part um, a, a response, especially of students who are at elite institutions, such as the ones I've taught, Princeton, Georgetown and Notre Dame, to the following extent that, um, and, and I actually this is in response to, the, the essay was written in response to an essay that was written uh, a number of years ago, about 15 years ago, it was actually 2001 before, uh, it was April of 2001 before 9-11. It was an essay by David Brooks that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly called The Organization Kid, a wonderful essay, you can find it online. And, and what Brooks did in the essay, he hung around Princeton uh, for about a month or visited for about a month and just talked to students and what he discovered was that students really understood themselves to be fundamentally the result of this kind of planned existence and that they got into Princeton and they had these sort of bright hopeful futures precisely because as he, as he tells it like from the time that they were already in the womb uh, they were being pre prepared and trained to be Princetonians and eventually masters of the universe. So they were the result of this kind of very profoundly planned life in which they were going to be what they self-describe as tools, capitalist tools, right, in the Forbes sense. My students are very much, in some ways, they identify with, the, with this essay profoundly still. And it's funny because the essay describes how hopeful and optimistic these students are in April of 2001. My students aren't quite as hopeful and optimistic. But one thing that, that is strikingly true about um, my, the students I've had is that they're not... In my experience, they're not, they don't all want to be artists. Well, I'll put it this way. They might want to be artists. They might want to be poets. But they've been raised from the youngest age to, to know and understand they have to succeed in this economic. They don't have a choice. Uh, they come to me and sort of plead to me, please give me permission to take a course in classics. As an adult, I can give them permission to do that. That I can, they can allow them to do this, right? But that, that much of their lives have been organized around being able to succeed under this cap. I, I don't see as much evidence uh, that, at least again, among the students that I have, which might be again a self-selected group. But moving away from millennials, what, 
what I think is striking, and actually it gives me a chance to show a few of these slides, is that this is not what I've been describing, in particular the sense of being increasingly detached, isolated, um, less and less relational, that as I've ended my uh, talk by suggesting that liberalism, far from in some ways describing our nature, makes us into these creatures. But this is not, in fact, something that happened with the millennial generation. They are only the most recent manifestation of this. And I thought I'd show you a few slides from uh, this. This is a, the Pew Millennial Survey, but it's more than the Millennial Survey. It's a survey of generations that was done in 2014. These are just a few select findings. It uh, analyzes these four generations that it groups into these years. So the silent generator, this is Calvin Coolidge here, 8 to 45, sort of uh, Great Depression until the end of World War II. Baby booms from 46 to 64. I'm right at the end. That's my birth. Uh, Generation X, 65 to 80. So you see the 80 there. And then the millennial generation born after 1980. Then uh, in just in this uh, survey, they ask a lot of questions, but I just thought I'd show you a few of these findings. That so it says millennials unmoored from institutions, but notice how these are, you know, uh, it, it follows uh, the colors here. It really follows the generation. So this is not merely just a kind of random grouping of Use. There's actually a development from one generation to the next. But over roughly the, ha the last 85, 90 years, almost 100 years, what we have seen is a general increase in detachment from institutions that would once have been sort of ways that we would define ourselves in relationship to others, whether it's political members of a political party or a political movement, uh, certainly as members of a religious affiliation. Uh, I think this number has actually gone quite a bit higher now among probably up in the 30s now, of nuns, which unfortunately I'm Catholic, it's not N-U-N-S, it's uh, <laughs> N-O-N-E-S, it's nuns, no religion. Uh, so we see, again, this remarkable uh, generational sort of movement toward detachment uh, with marriage today, uh, that by the, age of, by the age of 32, 65% uh, would have been married in the silent generation as opposed to today, uh, who I think... 30, 30 years of age are taken. The millennial generation, 26% uh, are married. Um, how the generations see themselves, just uh, how remarkably consistent these generational changes are. Uh, the support of gay rights doesn't speak so much to this, but the idea of being patriotic, of identifying with your nation, being a religious person. This one I found interesting and surprising being an environmentalist, right? higher among the silent generation. You sort of think the millennials are all, maybe here in Colorado, you're all like crazy green. But out there in the world, the younger you are, the more like you are not an, not an environmentalist. So why is that? Right? Environmentalists tend to be people who care about the future, right? future generations. I get a sort of striking finding. Uh, and finally, this, uh, this one I find, trust toward others. Look at where the millennials are. When you grow up with the internet, Facebook and Twitter, you learn not to trust others. But again, these are part of long-standing trends. So I would only say that this didn't appear with the millennial generation, this sense of disconnection, the sense of increasing isolation and, and weakness, right? It's in many ways been shaped by an entire unfolding of a worldview. And part of my argument is that liberalism was succeeding to the extent it succeeded for a long time because it wasn't fully liberal. People weren't fully individualistic. They weren't fully detached from each other. It's becoming, in a sense, more itself over time. And the sort of social science data and the feedback from the world shows us how this becomes increasingly untenable and unsustainable. Next question. Right. Um, okay. Here you go, sir. Are those figures you have up there reflecting the views at the same age or at the same point in time? So, for instance, if this was taken in 2013, is it comparing an 80-year-old to a 20-year-old, or is it comparing all of these groups I, at the time that's they were 20? a really good question. I, I'm a political theorist, and so I'm not really good with them. I believe these are longitudinal. I believe these are done over time. But, but I, don't quote me on that. And so, so we may have to blank the recording there. 
You can you can look that up. Some. That's a good question. Right. Let me. Uh, during your talk, I heard. Um, well, it seemed to me that there are a lot of parallel arguments that could be made. All the points that you made about the end of capitalism, from Marx's perspective. Um, I guess I'm curious about how you see the connection between liberalism and capitalism and their decay seeming to coincide. Yeah, uh, I have to be careful because I'm told that um, I may get Professor Beckwith fired if I say anything more <laughs> bad about capitalism. Uh, so. uh, sorry, Frank. <laughs> Um, I, it seems to me that, that, uh, that the basic anthropology of liberalism and the basic anthropology of capitalism were essentially born together. Uh, that capitalism, or what we would call market capitalism, is, the, is the, 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 the glove into which the liberal society itself fit itself. So they, have, they were born together. They have grown up together. They are mutually supporting. You could say there's a, there's a kind of corresponding economic system to every supposition or theory of human nature. Every supposition or theory of human nature has a corresponding economic system, as it does a political system. This is all I teach in my Intro to Political Theory class. Political theory is basically a, a debate over human nature, and different forms of politics reflect different views of human nature. The same thing is true of economics. Right? So it seems to me that there's no coincidence the extent to which we see this kind of shakiness of our market system, both in terms of... Um, not necessarily in terms of the goods and you know, the, what, what the benefits we've been able to have over the last 100, 150 years, but over its kind of legitimacy in the eyes of growing numbers of people. And the same thing is true, what's remarkable is how closely that's reflected as well in our political system, closely that tracks our political system. Uh, so I would say that the, the kind of crises that one sees in both of these, certainly a kind of crisis of legitimacy, is I think reflected, uh, is reflective of really fundamentally the same set of crises arising from anthropological um, unsustainability in some ways, if I can put it that way, a theory of human nature that is unsustainable. And I, I, would, only, I would only say that I personally uh, would not conclude my talk tonight, here maybe I can allow Frank to keep his job, with a Marxist conclusion, because it seems to me Marxism is also, and indeed in, in many ways is a much more obviously brutal and uh, dictatorial uh, ideology. I'm not here to promote one ideology over another ideology. I'm not here to promote communism over capitalism. I would say that I do think, and I hear I agree with Aristotle, that human beings are by nature sort of designed to desire private property. And we do best when we have private property, when we have our own things. We take care of our own things. How many of you live in a dorm? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, I don't even want to go in those bathrooms. Right. You, you want to go? Okay. <laughs> well, maybe for different reasons, but we won't go there. I mean, when people don't own, when, they don't, when, they, when they're not responsible for their things, right, they don't take good care of them. Aristotle noticed this you know, 2,500 years ago. Right? We tend to take care of the things that are ours. Uh, it seems to be built into the fabric of what it is to be a human being. And one of the things, the fundamental ways in which the ide ideology of Marxism was false is that it denied this aspect of our nature. So the question to me is how can we conform that reality of our nature with also something else that Aristotle recognizes, which is that we're social and political animals. We're creatures that are not utility-maximizing individuals. Not how we are in our families, it ought not to be how we are in our neighborhoods and our communities, and it ought not to be how we are in our markets. One of the things I love most about South Bend is our market. It's a great market because it's a community. Right? It's not just kind of raw self-interest and people trying to get ahead. There's a lot of friendship there. So I would like to think about what, is a, what does an economy look like that, in the words of Pope Benedict, includes uh, the theology of the gift. Theology of the gift that, that can include the idea that there's gratuitousness or grace included in our econ economic exchanges. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you said a lot of things uh, that... <laughs> that I would agree with, but I would disagree with your conclusion. For instance, you say that it's causing an increase in detachment, but then you sort of assert that that's a bad thing. Tell me how you would respond to me saying that it's demonstrable that capitalism dramatically raises our standard of living, and from an evolutionary perspective, our evolutionary fitness. 
how would you respond to me saying that capitalism is the next stage in human evolution and that these inconsistencies are holdovers from our hunter-gatherer instincts and that what should really happen is that evolutionary pressures should realign our kind of instincts into being more uh, consistent with what we have currently. It's, it's really interesting. Um, I, my, friend, uh, my friend Peter Lawler, uh, who teaches at Berry College, you should get him out here, Frank, uh, he says he sort of divides the world today into Darwinians and Lockeans. Those are our kind of options. The Lockeans think we're profoundly and totally autonomous and free. They were completely free agents, that we were just free choosers. We have no, no relationality. We're not sort of social and political creatures. The Darwinians think, no, we're, we're completely natural creatures. We're creatures that are driven by our evolutionary imperatives. And there's no choice there. You just have to do whatever your evolutionary imperative here. And as a Christian, Peter's one and I'm one, I say, no, I'm neither of these. I'm free. I'm free. I'm not simply a result of my... I refuse to simply understand myself as simply a consequence of my evolution. And I understand I'm also a creature. I'm an animal. And evolution plays a part in who I am. But I'm also a human being. I can choose. I'm free. Now, I'm not a Lockean either. I don't simply get to choose everything because I'm relational. I'm political. I'm part of the logos. I'm part of the created order. Right? It seems to me that we've divided our world into so either you're not free at all, you're the result of these forces, or you're radically free. My talk tonight was in some ways try to put these two things together and say the irony of liberalism is that we think we're all autonomous and free, and yet we're all subject to these forces. We got the worst of both worlds. And I would argue if we actually want to be free, we have to say, how is it that we can be free and not be simply subject to these forces that are supposed to be liberating us? That's a great question, and you might be right. In that case, then we're all going to evolve, and so we shouldn't worry about it. But then we're not terribly free. So... Uh, how much do you see liberalism as a Christian heresy or a series of Christian heresies? Now we're into it. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think liberalism is, is impossible without Christianity. I think it is an outgrowth. I think it is a heretical outgrowth of Christianity. It, it, to the extent that it is true, I would, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there right now. To the extent that it is true, it reflects some deep truth about our, ourselves as creatures of, created in the divine order. That we are creatures who are accorded with a fundamental dignity. That we are creatures who should be recognized as having freedom and rights. Right? That, we are, that we are these creatures. But of course, what, we can say what liberalism does, I think very interesting what liberalism does, is it divides two aspects of Christianity. On the one hand, it, uh, and to get back to the question about Marxism, one side of Christianity, one side of the coin of Christianity argues that we are fallen. It's the Calvinist side. We could put it that way. We're fallen. We're self-interested. We, can, we can't act. We're depraved. We simply pursue our own goods and ends. We're sinful. That's Hobbes, Locke, and many of the American founders. The other side of liberalism said, no, we can overcome our self-interest. We can be saved in this time and place. This is, this is the progressive wing of liberalism, what we today call progressivism. We can completely overcome our selfishness. We can completely transcend the sinfulness that defined us. Right? This is John Dewey. This is Walter Rauschenbusch. This is Richard Rorty. Walt Whitman. Emerson. Right? This, is, this is this wing. And what it seems to me is what we've done, what liberalism has done, has divided the deep truth of Christianity that both of these are, in a sense, true. We are sinful. We are self-seeking. We are depraved. But we're also subject of grace. We're human. We're social. We're political. We're relational creatures. Liberalism, in some ways, you could say, is, is a kind of the heresy of dividing the truths of Christianity. And today, what our politics is, is fighting over which of these heresies is right. <laughs> this is the, the woeful condition of being a Christian in American politics today is to have to choose between two falsehoods, it seems to me. I've been voting since I was 18, and I haven't been happy about it once. This year I'll be happy. I'm just not going to vote. <laughs> not really happy. I was in academia. After I left, I got over. 
Sounds Being in academia is very depressing. <laughs> sounds to me like you're a sweet meteor of death. That's, that's my candidate, and, Smod and, 16. And, and, and so I say, be of good cheer, because this week the Russians are threatening nuclear war. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> uh, I should say that I'm, I'm not as depressed or uh, uh, um, pessimistic as I come off, I suppose. There's something, I find something joyful about not feeling that my entire life has to be invested in maintaining the system. I find it liberating. I find that too many of the ways in which we understand our condition is that we have to shore up this falsehood or this falsehood to get back to that question. And I, I, feel, I feel a kind of joy in being able to say, look, let's, let's call things what they are, and let's see if we can build something out of that. So I, 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 I actually, I, I find myself rather... Not optimistic, but hopeful. Hi, thank you for the talk. My question um, concerns where you want to go from the observation that liberalism, um, and I agree that um, the, you know, the, the problems that you've identified, there's real connecting tissue between um, you know, those problems and their causes in like the Enlightenment liberalism, um, classical liberalism. I wonder if the conclusion to be drawn from this is not to reject liberalism outright, um, but rather to insist that we've swung too far in one direction of the pendulum, so to speak. Um, my mind goes perhaps to the contrast between the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Um, and I think both can be described as liberal, um, but I think you'd agree that there's a fundamental difference in character. Um, and I think the American Revolution, uh, while being properly described as liberal, has conservative elements as well. And I wonder if that conservatism of the Founding Fathers is not mere schizophrenia or um, remnants of conservatism that have not been yet shaken off um, by, you know, by following their beliefs to their logical conclusions. I wonder if there is some kind of reconciliation um, that we can have between 18th century, perhaps um, 19th century conservatism and liberalism. Great, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually have extensive thoughts and uh, writings on my view of the American founding, which uh, are, are often um, point to the way in which this, the ideology I've described is present there. Although you're right, there are, it's a kind of, it's a, as any kind of political movement, it had many kind of strains flowing into it. Um, but I, I tend to be, uh, I had, couldn't go through a night without mentioning Tocqueville, so I'll mention Tocqueville, I guess I mentioned him earlier. I tend to be more of a Tocquevillian on this. When, when Tocqueville came to, to America in the 1830s, uh, what struck him was that Americans had a, had a liberal philosophy. They would describe everything that they did in terms of their liberal philosophy. A chapter that's called Self-Interest Rightly Understood, he says Ameri even when Americans act altruistically, they describe what they're doing in terms of self-interest. And he has this wonderful line. He says, they do more honor to their philosophy than to themselves. They do more honor to their philosophy than to themselves. I love that line because it really speaks, I think, to the fact that for a very long time in American history, going back in some ways to these slides, Americans didn't act in accordance with their philosophy. We had this philosophy. We've had it for a long time. But we didn't live up to it. We didn't conform ourselves to it. One of the things Tocqueville is constantly describing and worried about in democracy in America is that there will be this very powerful force that when you describe your acts in a way, that you eventually start to conform yourself to your words. And that's what I think in part these slides show, or, or lots of evidence, lots of evidence of kind of changes. Bob Putnam stuff, right? The decline of civic capital, uh, the decline of bowling, you know, bowling leagues in favor of bowling alone all the various kinds of social science data that show a right, breakdown of families, communities, neighborhoods, churches, church affiliation, religious affiliation, voluntary association, et cetera, et cetera. All this, it seems to me, evidence of what Tocqueville worried about, which is when people begin to conform their actions to the way that they describe their actions. So I would say that what we need is less ideology. What we need is less to talk about restoring the founding Restoring the Constitution. I mean, it's important for us, of course, to get the institutions right and to get federalism right, for starters, would be great. To get our jurisprudence right would be great. But the first order of business is to start acting less like liberals, to start acting more like neighbors and 
family members and fathers and sons and daughters and mothers and etc cetera, etc cetera, to think of ourselves as part of something greater than ourselves which is not just the state and this is the key aspect what Tocqueville feared was that a society that understands itself to be fragmented dissolved ab abstracted from one another would be a society that would turn only to one entity alone the state it would only have one recourse when times got tough, it would turn to the state. What Tocqueville reveals is that at the heart of our great debate, whether we should have more individualism, Republicans have argued for a long time, or more statism, Democrats have argued for a long time. Tocqueville sees these two things work hand in glove, reinforce each other, profoundly reinforcing. So I, I would be a Tocquevillian on your question, which is, might be true, that there's a conservative aspect of the founding that we can recover, but I think what we need to recover more are certain kinds of practices. And when we've begun to recover those practices, maybe our theories will get better too. Great question, though. Thank you. We have time for about two more questions, which puts me in a difficult position because there's more than two hands up. So I, uh, get this guy back here. He uh, came all the way from Denver. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's my uh, old friend Mike Baxter. He used okay. to teach at Notre Dame. So. <laughs> If I could impose a speaker's privilege. So, um, uh, thanks, Patrick, and maybe we can squeeze in three. Um, you know, I, I loved your talk because it's uh, it made even me um, think that you're really depressing. And uh, <laughs> I tend That's to, not easy to do. Mike. I tend to have an apocalyptic personality too. Um, I don't think uh, what you describe is accurately summed up as saying Marx is right. But um, I do think, in a way, uh, that your description indicates that Weber was right. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's the case, one question I have, and I hope we can talk about this some more. Um, you know, McIntyre wrote his book 35 years ago, and a lot, but before a lot of these trends at least the most recent. What you're referring to is called After Virtue. Yeah, a book called After <laughs> Virtue. And I, and I detect your Aristotelianism in your answers. Um, so are you saying, in effect, that um, McIntyre was right and has been all along since 1981 when that book came out? Uh, the McIntyre's, McIntyre's premise, is, his argument is that um, we live in a world that Patrick described and that um, bureaucracy is unmanageable and that whenever we try to manage it, whether it come in the form of the state or the corporation, we ourselves get managed and that we have to turn to local forms of politics and, and market economy distributism in order to uh, survive. Against the 20th century background, McIntyre's argument, I think, is a, is a sound of hope. He was a Marxist until that point, and in many ways still is in his diagnosis of capitalism. But uh, it's a much, you know, you, don't, you have 15 more pages where you're going to tell us what, to do, what is to be done. Um, but my question is, give us, a little, give us a little sense of what is to be done, and, and I suppose my question is, does it end up sounding like McIntyre's Aristotle? Uh, so that's a good question. I, so Alistair McIntyre is now, I guess, a colleague of mine at Notre Dame. Uh, I, I see him on occasion. Those of you who may, not, may or may not know Matt, Alistair McIntyre, one of our greatest living philosophers, wrote a book in 1981, published a book in 81 called After Virtue, and argued that we live in a time after virtue, after um, essentially what had been the, the premise of the West, uh, of, of certainly Christianity in the classical tradition, which was that human flourishing was achieved when human beings lived in accordance with virtue, something they had to be educated into. They didn't have it, like you have rights. Virtue is something you attain or achieve. And McIntyre argued we lived in a time of kind of fragmentation because we could no longer agree even what it is we were doing, why we were educating people, what, what the purpose of life was, what the end of life was, so that we thought we could all just kind of get along by not answering that question. The result of that is we live in a world essentially that's nihilistic. He said it's either Nietzsche or Aristotle. Those are your choices, uh, he argued in that book. Um, 
it's I, I didn't read Nietzsche. Uh, sorry, I didn't read. I didn't read uh, McIntyre until just a few years ago. I'm a political theorist, and so he was a philosopher, and uh, he wasn't on our reading list. What's so What's interesting is that what I what I have sort of come to understand over the years was largely through it was Aristotelian, but it was through a different Aristotle. It was through Aristotle of the politics as opposed to Aristotle of the ethics. It was the political. Aristotle, as opposed to the sort of more philosophical Aristotle. And it was through figures like Tocqueville, who I think has, doesn't appear, as far as I know, he certainly doesn't appear prominently in McIntyre's writings. Uh, it was through um, really the kind of the, the core texts of political philosophy. So what I find striking in some ways about my relationship to McIntyre intellectually, I hardly know him personally, but intellectually, is that it's possible and interesting to arrive at very similar conclusions through a completely different kind of literature and a completely different discipline, which suggests to me this kind of independent status and truth or at least viability of this position. Um, so I guess this is partly by me, me saying, look, I didn't just get this. I didn't rip this off from McIntyre. <laughs> so I'm suggesting that. But also that uh, I guess the one critique I would have of McIntyre is that I think ultimately at the end of the day he's not political enough. I just I don't think he I don't think he necessarily thinks in those terms. And maybe at the end of the day I'm not philosophical enough. Um, but part of those 15 pages is thinking through the politics. What does it look like? What does the politics look like? And that's in part. So a promissory note is well we have to think about of course the Constitution and think about the Constitution. But as a political theorist we have to think also about what are alternatives, right? How would we begin to think about alternatives? But it's a, it's a great question. I'm, I'm fascinated by McIntyre. I assign McIntyre a lot. I now have a lot of McIntyrean disciples running around at Notre Dame, un, unbeknownst to Alistair McIntyre. Um, but, uh, but I do find at the end of the day that um, he, leaves, he leaves me and many of my students unsatisfied about the political question. Yeah. Time for one more question. Um, okay, I'll... Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, Welcome. I feel like I need to say that at first. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm being really nervous right now. I shouldn't be doing that. So people have been saying that liberalism will collapse for a very long period of time now, at least 170 years as far as I know. And they've tried other ideologically driven modes of organizing societies, both of which, the major ones at least, both of which seem to have totally collapsed and no longer exist. So what's different now that wasn't different in the past? That means it's the end of liberalism. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm actually, you know, in my talk, I actually don't, it's, I know it says the end of liberalism. So it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm playing on the word end. Uh, so in one sense, it's at least a suggestion. Maybe, maybe it is the end, right? Predicted for a long time. Uh, and as I suggested in the talk, Political systems, at least ideological systems, fall apart when the gap between claims and reality become too, too, too vast. I think, at least my suggestion was that I think that's, that seems to be at least part of what is happening in the world today. Um, but it was also, the title was meant also to say sort of the end of liberalism in terms of its telos or its culmination end its goal, its achievement or accomplishment. And in this sense, I'm making no claim that liberalism will fail or, I, well, I'm making no claim that liberalism will end when it reaches its end. In fact, I can imagine that liberalism will continue as far and as long as the eye can see. But it seems to me it will do so under conditions in which it will either have to say, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. You know, we're going we're to have fairly unresponsive political system. We're going to have a titanically unequal economic system. We're going to have systems of bureaucracy and science and technology that you will not be able to control. We will have an education system that will indoctrinate you to become tools of this system. That's what you're going to get. And I, I could imagine that we could have that for a very long time. But that will be a little bit of a different story than what we're getting now. Or I could imagine um, that simply, uh, it simply becomes a fairly 
visibly authoritarian system. One, one book I would recommend if you're not sufficiently depressed yet is a book uh, called um, Average is Over by an economist named Tyler Cowen, teaches at George Mason University. Uh, Average is Over. So it's a remarkable book. It's written by a, very much a proponent and um, supporter of our free market economic system. What he argues is that basically, uh, particularly automation, is going to put a lot of people out of work, as we're already seeing. Uh, and that more and more of what we're going to regard as rewarding work is going to have to, in some ways, add value to what a machine or a computer can do. If you can't add value to what a machine or a computer can do or do something that a machine or a computer can't do, then you will be sort of, well, you'll probably be employed in some form, but it won't be, you won't be bragging about your job uh, when you go home at Thanksgiving. But he ends the book in this remarkable way. He says, basically, he envisions a world in which you will have, you know, roughly 10% of the population, 15% of the population, wildly interesting lives doing really interesting work, traveling and living in Boulder and going to great restaurants and you know, just incredibly <laughs> wonderful lives. And the other 85 to 90 percent of the population, he said, are going to live in the equivalent of Brazilian favelas in America. He says especially in Texas right, will be a real magnet. And any state that can make itself more like Texas will be places that draw the rest of this 85 or 90 percent. But good Good politicians, smart politicians, will give them free internet so that they won't really, they'll actually be really kind of happy because, well, you know, to get back to the first question, they'll be much better off than people were 150 years ago because they'll have free internet and they'll be able to have all the free porn that they want. So it's going to be, it's going to be great. It's going to be beautiful. And then, and then Tyler Cowen ends the book in the following way. He says, and this will be the utopia that Marxism promised, but only capitalism could deliver. I'm not kidding. This is the way that it ends. This is the way that it ends. He, he actually argues this will be the, the promised utopia. Now, I, I read that, and I don't see that as utopic, personally. Um, but it does seem to me to be sort of one liberal, who's a very self-declared liberal economist, pulling off the mask. Saying, this is what it's going to be, and it's going to be great. Because we're not going to be starving, right? We're not going to be like those people in 1900 who were just miserable all the time thinking about their lives compared to people in 2016. We're not going to be miserable. We're going to live relatively long and healthy lives until we're euthanized. And we'll have Internet. And I guess I'll end there. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you for the wonderful <laughs> lecture and the great conversation. And uh, uh, I, I think we've got some uh, after, afterwards. We, you can mingle and talk, and uh, you're dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>